I feel like life would just be better if there was slide guitar under almost everything. Do <laughs> you? Slide guitar just does something to a morning, doesn't it? Or, I, I may, know or what maybe, you mean. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's to a, real a mood setter. It is a mood setter. It, it, it got us starting the show. I mean, we're never late because you know it is what it is. Uh, but but we were flirting. We were flirting with starting the show. You know, we do this live every morning at uh, ten thirty Eastern, eight thirty Mountain Time from our home studio, our Real Talk World Headquarters in Alberta's capital city, Edmonton. But uh, we were flirting with 831 Mountain Time because there it was, Ayla Brooke and the Soundman, that slide guitar, that incomparable sound, of course, featured from their wonderful album, Desolation Sounds on Fallen Tree Records. Love it. Happy to hear uh, to have you here with us this morning, uh, friends. Thank you to those of you that are, that are downloading this podcast or checking out our YouTube video later in the day. We've got a lot of ground to cover today, including uh, we'll stack up Alberta and BC's reopening plans yesterday alberta's premier jason kenny rolling out uh, their roadmap the government's roadmap to what they believe is going to be the best summer ever they're saying that that albertans are, are crushing it said the premier yesterday says we're, we're, we're going to be able to to stamp this out just in time for summer and we want to know how you feel about it so you know every morning i send out a tweet uh, from my profile at ryan jesperson on twitter that's where you can follow me it's where you can find me and i've asked you essentially how do you feel about alberta's reopening plan and and it's a poll that we're going to leave open for the next 24 hours but we're going to take an, a look at it through the show today and early on i mean i posted it just a few minutes ago uh 15 minutes ago or so we've got, we've got about 270 votes there 61 percent say it's too soon about 24 percent say that you're torn and we're asking you to leave a comment below. And, and then about 15% of you say, well, it's about time. And we'll dig into that in just a moment. Want to remind you that uh, every morning this show is presented by our presenting sponsors at Bitcoin. Well, they're proud to be making sense of cryptocurrency, in particular Bitcoin for people across the country. They've got Bitcoin ATMs which make it easier than ever, makes it easier than ever to buy and sell Bitcoin. Plus, of course, they have their team of talented professionals that can provide the insights or answer the questions that you may have about financial sovereignty. What does that even mean? You can find Adam O'Brien's uh, recent appearance here on the show by way of our podcast or YouTube archives. And of course, you can find Bitcoin well under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. So we're getting the comments coming in on my tweet, uh, which is great, up to about 300 votes here. And the the numbers are holding steady, 63% of respondents early on. Keep in mind, this is the first 15 minutes or so that we've had it up. About 63% of respondents on this unofficial unscientific poll say that it's too soon about 23 percent of you say you're torn and about 15 percent of you say it's about time now now what are you torn over what are you torn about dj chocolate milk this morning says i'm 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 so thankful we don't listen to scientists or smart people in alberta let's keep the pandemic going a few more months because it's been a great time so far dj chocolate milk not not maybe thrilled that that alberta is going to be reopening uh in part Early next week on Tuesday, June 1st, and then, of course, uh, through the course of the summer, if hospitalizations drop, if vaccinations rise, so opens the province again. Pfizerized Chad, which is a great handle, says this plan has made me realize just how political the Calgary stampede is. Chad says, I've been there before. I've enjoyed my time there, but this year's stampede is set to be a MAGA festival make Alberta great again, and I'm not interested in any of it. Meantime, Jeremy Allen, who's been on this show before, you you remember Jeremy, Death Ed? Remember that? He's a funeral director, just a fascinating guy. We had a wonderful chat with him about processing grief, a really thoughtful guy. I'm not surprised to see that Jeremy's torn on this one. Hey, to show my cards, I'm torn on this one, too. I'll talk about that in just a second. Jeremy says, I'm torn. Says, the, you know, the constant evaluation of trying to understand that continued long term impact of the mental health and the displacement of social interaction and behavior. This is offset knowing that there's no way you can convince me it's safe to simply be back to normal in less than a month. That from Jeremy. I think it's I think that's a great comment. Karen says I work in the restaurant industry. I have mixed feelings about reopening. 
Karen says, I don't think the stampede should happen. We should give our healthcare workers and first responders a chance to catch their breath. It's been a horrible 15 months for them. Stampede can wait. LB says second doses, second doses, second doses. He's he's setting us up for one and done. And I suggest we reciprocate the sentiment with his term in office. L- LB is referring to the premier, of course. Robert says what I don't get about the plan is why it's so focused around the stampede. Robert says, I just want to safely hug my loved ones. I don't need to ride the Gravitron and eat elephant ears. That's going to earn a like from me, Robert. That's a great tweet. Hey, I've loved the Calgary Stampede for many years. You know, you know this, will be, this will be sort of portrayed. This is what Alberta's Premier is saying yesterday. He's saying, you know, there's, there's the pro-lockdown crowd, you know, and then there's the pro-opening crowd. It's kind of this thing where there's no nuance when, when politics become involved, it's very rarely nuance, right? So you have, you know, the premier of Alberta saying, and, and we'll bring you some of his comments from his, his, his uh, Facebook fireside chat. It was kind of an impromptu uh, surprise to the public. Anyway, Facebook fireside chat where he said, I mean, he, re- he really did say, you, could, you can watch it yourself if you like. He really did say he likes to get away from the questions that are exclusively asked by elite mainstream media. And so he likes to have these fireside chats uh, where he can answer questions and, and maybe be a little bit more himself all right, in, in front of his base. And we'll bring you some of his comments there. But, but uh, you know, there, there's no nuance. You either want to see people, you know, businesses survive in Calgary or you hate the stampede. Right. Those, those are going to be the two choices. So we'll provide nuance here. That's, that's the exact reason why in my tweet this morning and in my unofficial, unscientific Twitter poll, uh, why we gave you the option, I'm torn. Because I, I understand that feeling. I understand that sentiment. You know, we have friends like, like Justine Martinson, who was on the show last week. You remember she owns Lipstick Empire, and she was on, and she was kind of exacerbate, uh, or exasperated. Uh, and, and she was just saying, like, I don't even know what the solution is. All I know is that we're told we can reopen and then we spend a bunch of money and then we do. And then we're told we have to close and I have to lay off my staff for three weeks and this, that and the other. And she was so frustrated. And I'm happy to tell you that Justine reached out to me last night and she saw a little real talk bump. As a matter of fact, producers of CBC's The National saw her on Real Talk. They featured her last night on The National and Jason Kenny, the premier of Alberta, from his Facebook account, has just posted the story of Justine Martinson. And, and the premier has talked about what his government, the Alberta government, is prepared to do for small business owners right now, which is great. So, so Justine comes here on the show. A few days later, the premier of Alberta is tweeting about her or posting on his Facebook account about her specifically. People are paying attention to Real Talk. People understand that the stories that are told here are important and are representative of the the general population. You hear someone like Justine or you hear from some restaurateurs or or small business owners or festival organizers or whatever, right? You know exactly what I'm getting. I don't have to spell out every single person or every single industry that's eager to see somewhat of a return to normal, however we might describe that. On the flip side, we recognize that in most circumstances, a fully vaccinated person has seen two shots. Scientists and researchers are telling us that one shot of a vaccine is, is not effective at stamping down the curve. We're hearing about variants. We understand that we still have more than 150 people in Alberta's ICUs. We understand that we're not out of the woods yet. I'm not fear mongering. This is fact. And so you understand why some people who are picturing it, and maybe it doesn't play out this way, But some people who are picturing a full-blown Calgary stampede with the infield just packed at the rodeo or the casino humming, or you you get the idea. If you've ever been there, I don't have to tell you, how. first of all, how wonderful it can be. Second of all, how, how much of a nightmare it probably is for some of you. That's fine. Not your flavor. No problem. I'm the type that likes to have a a friend or family member up on my shoulders as we sway, listening to Jimmy Buffett covers, drinking cheap, watered-down margaritas at Nashville North, the outdoor stage. You know, my boots have seen plenty of shows and plenty of spills, and when the time is right, I will be right back there packing the house with everybody else at concerts and hockey games, and I can't wait. So I understand how eager people are. 
So where do you find that balance and how are you processing and, and how are you sifting through it? The real quick, basic details of this, Alberta's got a three-stage open for summer plan, plus a, a strategy and, it, and it's tied directly, as we said, to vaccination and hospitalization numbers. So June 1st, we've already reached those thresholds and here you can see it. So stage one, right? June 1st, the implications are that you can have outdoor gatherings of up to 10 people. Uh, personal and wellness services are allowed to reopen. It's great for people like hairstylists and others. Restaurant patios will be allowed to reopen just in time, you know, June 1st, kind of, you might call it the kickoff. I know technically May long is probably the kickoff to patio season, but, but there you have it. Outdoor sports and recreation for up to 10 people. I know a lot of parents are wondering, what does that mean for Sally's soccer team? And then retail stores will be allowed to have up to 15% of fire code occupancy. Nothing ever really seems to have changed for me with retail stores. Maybe that's just me. I've, I've never really noticed. I mean, if you say, oh, you know, they're bumping from 15% fire code capacity to 25. Does anybody actually have, first of all, is it ever enforced? Not a shot against the retailers. As a matter of fact, I've been in, in, in I should rephrase that. I've been in a ton of stores. Uh, the stores I have seen, shop owners have been very diligent. And a lot of this sort of ties into that personal responsibility thing. And there will be restaurants with patios and there will be others, you know, people that can open up on June 1st. They're going to say we're going to we're, we're going to be a little bit more hesitant or we're going to wait or we're going to we're going to base this on our own plan that, that will like maybe perhaps exceed some of the measures that the provincial plan does. Stage two, in theory, would begin two weeks after 60 percent of eligible Albertans have received at least one dose of vaccine and hospitalizations are below 500. If you want to get an idea right now, current hospitalizations in the province of Alberta per Alberta.ca 548. So you'd need about a 10 percent drop. You need about a 10 percent drop on hospitalizations to get to stage two. And then, you know, that that means that libraries and movie theaters could reopen. Movie theaters, that's, that's an interesting one. Maybe there's great ventilation in movie theaters. It feels to me like a movie theater might kind of be the last. I don't know. I shouldn't, you know, I don't know. I don't know what their HVAC looks like. But I don't know about you guys. Both of you, Sam, Sarah, both of your faces, you look kind of like. I, I, I won't be, it won't be the first place that I go. But that's all, yeah. So, and, and that's your choice, right? Yeah. That's my choice. A lot of people are, I don't know how people are finding. So there's this balance where people are saying, hey, listen. If, if you don't, feel, and some people, this has been their theory for the entirety the of COVID-19. Entire yeah. If you don't feel safe, don't leave the house. It's not sound public policy, public health policy, but, but at some point, we probably at some point have to start adopting that mindset to a certain degree with some things. I've, I mean, I've been doing that the entire time because I, I haven't felt confident in um, the public measures. Yeah. Let's 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 get to a, a pediatrician that's done a ton of work through COVID-19. Qu- quite frankly, she deserves some form of medal. Whether it's the lieutenant governor or the governor general or whoever's handing it out. I know she's going to get all she's going to say, no, there's, I'm just one of many. And this is what public health professionals have been doing the whole pandemic. Dr. Thaisin Letha, a back, a pediatrician, an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Alberta. Thank you for making time for us again. It's great to get you back on the show. Yeah, it's great to be back. Thanks, Ryan. Now, how are you wrapping your mind? I want to talk to you about, you know, variants. I want to talk to you about this, this, what are they calling it with the kids? This miss C we'll talk about that inflammation and some of the health complications we're seeing somewhat rare, but doesn't mean that parents don't want it on their radar. Generally speaking, the announcement, the reopening plan yesterday, where are you at? Where are you landing on it? So I'm calling it more of a charge ahead strategy, Um, you know, leave no survivors. I, I, I I don't really see it as a, as a plan so much as, um, as just, uh, you know, a a way to get there um, without really looking at whether it's safe to do so. And, you know, your poll, even though you say it's non-scientific and non-expert and, the respondents might not be scientists. I actually think that because of this pandemic, everybody has acquired so much scientific expertise and a lot of people have been reading the right sources, have been listening to the right people, and they realize um, that it's not safe because they, you know, people have been educating themselves. And I think that we've all in a way become um, 
an expert in our own right at this pandemic, even if you're not a medical professional and, and people are not feeling safe. And that's a huge sign, like the public, a lot of the public is not feeling safe. And another thing is, I mean, this, this strategy is the most relaxed in the country. Like you look at Ontario's plan, you look at BC's plan, uh, they're a lot more cautious. And I think we've learned in Alberta over and over again, that when we're not cautious, when we throw caution to the wind, um, we we become the worst in the country and the worst in, in North America. And that's what happened with the third wave. So I think, you know, all of us um, in the healthcare field, for sure, we're, we're just we're just sort of dreading that there's going to be another wave from this. We're worried that transmission is going to go sky high again, like it did in the third wave. Um, we just want our community to be safe. And, and like some people on Twitter said, you know, it's, it's really important that we get to see our loved ones. I think that's one of the most important things that I personally have been missing and I want to hug them. Right. And, and that wasn't really uh, mentioned in the reopening plan. Like when can you cohort with, with another bubble? Um, when can you have uh, a bubble with your family or, or your friends? Um, normalcy is so different to every person but really i think what would benefit people's people's mental health is to be able to see the people they love and touch the people they love because that hasn't been allowed really for for over six months and i think normalcy for many people growing up was not being able to go to restaurants and movie theaters many people couldn't afford that i know certainly for us growing up that wasn't part of our weekly routine and so um, you know, I think there's this element of privilege that when we we think of normalcy as being able to attend um, festivals and restaurants and bars, um, that's really a, a minority of the population that can afford to do these things. Yeah, I, I mean, there's so much politics at play here, which is obvious. Uh, the the idea of the stampede being open, it's it, it's it's a fascinating one that the premiers kind of latched onto. Like it, it it almost sounded like yesterday's news conference was more a news conference about the stampede. Really, is what it felt like. You know, he's talking about how it's a great day to be in the griddle rental business, and he's he's telling his staff to start considering planning a premier stampede breakfast and all these types of things. Um, the premier proud yesterday said Al- Al- Alberta is going to be essentially reopening first. We're going to be the first province to reopen across the country. When you contrast that with the recent news headlines, national headlines about Alberta, it's quite a contrast because all the other stories have been about how Alberta's numbers have led the country in all the wrong directions. I thought this was pretty interesting. Uh, This reporting from Katie DeRosa, who does a great job, a legislative reporter out of Victoria uh, for the Vancouver Sun. She talked to Dr. Bonnie Henry uh, BC's chief medical officer of health, uh, Katie DeRosa, reporting that Dr. Henry admits there is a risk that interprovincial travel could increase COVID-19 transmission after Alberta, this is BC's medical officer of health, after Alberta announced what she calls an ambitious reopening with all public health restrictions lifted there by early July. Alberta's decisions catching the attention of health professionals and no doubt politicians in neighboring jurisdictions as well, which I thought was pretty interesting. I thought that was pretty significant that she went on the record and talked about that. Mm -hmm. It is indeed. And I think you're right. We have been capturing headlines, but for all the wrong reasons, right? So Alberta was the last to regain control in the third wave. And now the fear is that we'll be the first to lose control again. Um, you know, some of the things that that we're looking at with this reopening plan are, um, as we've mentioned, one shot, we're looking at one vaccine. And there's some research coming out of, of England right now showing with the variant that originated in India, one shot might only provide 40% protection against getting symptomatic COVID. Um, so, you know, when even when you said the words, we might be fully open by July, I just, you know, my 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 heart sinks and I feel so scared because, you know, this pandemic is not over. And as much as we want it to be, uh, we really need to look at keeping our community safe and, and getting to the end. And we're almost there. And if we could have just held on a little bit longer, it would have been much safer to reopen. But 
that's not the way this province is going to go. And so we have to wait and see what will happen. And, and you know, all predictions are it's unlikely to be good. Doctor, this will be uh, politicized today. I know that, you know, Rachel Notley, for example, says, you know, I, I'm paraphrasing her message yesterday, said basically it didn't strike her that the premier had had been looking ahead with any forecasting on health statistics. She said it it seemed to her like he just took a look at the start date of the Calgary Stampede and counted backward and built his plan from there. When you're saying that you have concerns around, you know, safety or public health implications around reopening first on, on June 1st, stage one, and then, you know, potentially a couple weeks later, stage two, and then fully open by July, what would a more safe or prudent or evidence-based plan look like to you? What are some of the, the more concerning or egregious points that jumped out at you about the premier's plan? So, you know, initially, the, the first one is that we've already met the criteria for the first stage of reopening. Um, and so really what should have been done is there should have been criteria used um, for a future endpoint that we were going to meet in order to, to get to the first stage. So like you said, it seems like we've already decided we're going to go ahead. Um, and so it was it was set that we've already met the criteria to, to move ahead. Um, we're using one dose of vaccine, and that, that's concerning, as I mentioned, because of variants. We're also using hospitalizations again, which time and time again, um, healthcare professionals, scientists, um, public health professionals have said is a lagging indicator. And, and now the public all knows what that means. I mean, we don't see hospitalizations go up until two to four weeks after cases go up. So when we look at increases in hospitalizations, we're actually looking at cases that have already risen and, and we're at a point where we've lost control. And so instead of using hospitalizations, a lagging indicator, we should be using leading indicators. So the, the number of cases per day, um, the percent positivity, uh, we should also be looking at the number of variants. And that's something that, uh, as we know, we haven't even been testing for lately because we haven't had the capacity. So if these variants, such as those that originated in India increase, then certainly we have to look at should we still be you know forging ahead with this reopening plan and then the other thing is testing and tracing capacity so if we're we're unable to actually trace back um, because our system is overwhelmed and it has been in the past couple of months then even if there are outbreaks we're not going to be able to know where they started um, and how to control them so so a number of concerns really from a from a health perspective brandy's chiming in on twitter as we're talking uh, doctor she says i'm angry that our reopening plan seems to be designed around a tradition that could give us 10 straight days of super spreader events uh, the science says it's not safe until more than 70 percent have that second dose i predict a bad fourth wave in the fall if there's a fourth wave that could have been prevented if, if, if i know i talk I, i'm gonna be honest I, I feel like i talk too much about restaurant tours i don't i mean i could bang the drum they've struggled uh, definitely uh through this pandemic so have millions of other people in hundreds of other industries i don't mean to always just lazily go to that one but if i'm a restaurateur that has to close again in september or october i'm gonna i would lose my mind i mean is the idea of a fourth wave on your radar is that a possibility you think i mean i think a lot of people have confidence that as vaccinations happen especially those second doses that this is going to become less and less of a concern but we're not doctors you are no i if vaccinations will help for sure, but vaccinations aren't our, our only ticket out of this. And, and I think that's the key thing. And certainly once people have the second dose of vaccine, we definitely are closer to that end goal. But I mean, when we look at the fall, um, so we'll just take we'll just take some vaccine uptake um, issues and and people who aren't eligible for vaccine, for example. We look at the fall, you know, schools are meant to reopen in person. There's still going to be the under 12 age group that's unvaccinated. And if we look at vaccine uptake in different regions of Alberta, we find that some communities, for example, Lethbridge, they have vaccine uptakes less than 20 percent. So and one of the markers for reopening is actually looking at vaccine uptake in the entire province, not looking at individual jurisdictions. 
Um, so we're certainly at risk for a fourth wave. And, and I agree with you, Ryan. I mean, nobody wants to close down again. And it is a possibility that they won't implement public health restrictions again um, because our hospitals will have the capacity to deal with the numbers that get sick. But that begs the question, I mean, who are we protecting? We're protecting our healthcare system, but why aren't we protecting Albertans? Um, I'll talk a bit more about the stampede after we thank you for your time. I want to value every single minute we have with you. Um, we have received word in, in confidence, or at least you know, sort of anonymously from a credible source that members of the Calgary Stampede Board are appalled at how their name and their event has been invoked as part of this. I mean, the Calgary Stampede, like it or not, is being directly tied almost as the bedrock of this government's reopening plan, which which may have political implications. Perhaps it's the move of a of a politician that that suspects he can gain some support back in a jurisdiction that's important to him. Calgary is the battleground for the next election. Edmonton's going to vote NDP. Rural's probably not. And Calgary's going to be the battleground. So people would be well served to keep an eye on that. I wanted to play this clip from you. This is from last night, somewhat of an impromptu. At, at least it wasn't announced very far ahead of time. A Facebook fireside chat from Premier Jason Kenney, who, who had this to say. I mean, th this is the spin on people that would have concerns, the two-thirds or so of the hundreds that are responding to our Twitter poll this morning, uh, when it comes to, you know, concerns were opening or reopening too early. This was Premier Kenney last night. Look, if we keep telling people that they should take the vaccine, but we're going to keep their lives largely and freedoms largely impaired for an indefinite period of time until any reasonable risk is completely eliminated, then why take the vaccine? What's the benefit of it? Thoughts? <laughs> um, so there's, I mean, the, the, the issue is this again, is the same public health messaging that we've heard all along that vaccines is our ticket out of this. And there's so many reasons that it's not. Vaccines have to be combined with public health restrictions in order to work because number one, we're not at the point where everyone has had their second dose. Number two, not everyone is available or eligible to get their second dose, like children under 12, of course. Um, and, and also because there's many people who are thinking of not getting the vaccine and there's variants that may escape vaccine immunity. So, I mean, the, the, the scientific community, the, the medical community knows that you can't rely just on vaccines to get us out of this. Um, why take a vaccine? Because it protects you as an individual. Um, it also protects the community, um, but why do we need public health restrictions for those same reasons to protect us as individuals and us as a community? It's it's a it's a multi pronged approach. We can't rely on one single thing to get us out of this. And in terms of you know indefinitely having restrictions, it has felt like we've been. Um, tolerating restrictions indefinitely in some senses, but that's because we always reopen too soon and we always close too late. Um, you know, one example is in January, if we had kept a, a strict sort of lockdown for seven extra weeks, we wouldn't would have gotten to zero COVID and we could have reopened safely similar to Australia and New Zealand and not been yo-yoing back and forth with the businesses, with the schools. Um, and we could have been back to, you know, really everyone's normalcy. Uh, and so there were strategies to do this that weren't implemented. And the reason we've needed longer lockdowns and more restrictions uh, for a longer period of time is because each time the policymakers have let it get too out of control. Doctor, as mentioned, obviously, you're a pediatrician. Uh, you, you care about kids. It's, it's your life's calling. It's the work that you do. I, I was hoping that I know that parents are, are obviously, um, you know, concerned about their kids more than anybody else. We love our kids more than we love ourselves or anybody else. And we want to make sure that they're healthy. There are vaccine implications to kids, those under 12, at least right now, not receiving it. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, if there's any plans coming up. But we do know that at least 23 kids in the province have been hospitalized with what's known as miss c so i understand it to be some sort of an, a muscle inflammatory condition can, can you help us understand what this is what the warning signs are what parents need to know 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, MIS-C is a, it's, it's a bit of a mouthful. It's a multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And it's a serious illness that occurs two to six weeks after a child has had COVID infection. And what parents want to be on the lookout for is a persistent fever. So a fever that's three days or longer, along with any other signs of illness. And that can include vomiting and diarrhea. It can include swelling of the arms, the legs, rash. Um, it can include the child being really lethargic, having chest pain. Um, but really, any time a child has a fever uh, for longer than three days, especially if they've had an exposure to COVID in the last few weeks, even if you haven't had them tested and don't know that they had COVID for sure, they need to be checked out by a health professional to see if they could have Miss c um, Miss c always requires hospitalization. If it's treated early, most children recover. There's about a 2% fatality rate for it for Miss C. But if left untreated, um, it can leave long term damage to multiple organs or, it, or it's fatal. And so you really need early access to health care for this condition. Um, you know, this is one of the reasons that that pediatricians have been so concerned when COVID rates went so high and COVID transmission was rampant in schools, uh, even though it's rare, it's serious. And so when we when we allow COVID to become rampant in our community, um, and we saw that it, there were so many outbreaks in schools, uh, you see more children affected with serious conditions like Miss C. And, and that's something we want to catch early on. And that's one of the reasons why we want community transmission to be low, because we don't want to ignore certain populations in the community. And I would say during this pandemic, children have been largely ignored. We've been treating COVID sort of in silos saying, um, you know, it's the elderly that are at most risk. And certainly that's true, but it needs to be acknowledged that everyone is at risk from COVID-19 and, and that includes children. And so when we're implementing these public health measures, we're doing it for the safety of everyone, including children. Um, and as you said, Ryan, uh, children under 12 still aren't eligible for vaccine. That's the truth. Um, there are trials going on to see if they can become eligible soon, but that may not be until next year, especially for the younger age groups. And Ms. C affects kids of all ages, but especially kids from age 6 to 12. And so we're looking at a group that will likely be unimmunized come fall. And that's why we don't want to get ahead of ourselves in this reopening and cause high rates come fall because kids will be in school again. And that's the susceptible age group that is at risk for Miss C. Rob's watching in from Vancouver this morning. He says a, re a reopening plan enables opportunity and choice. He says they establish boundaries or put fences around what's allowed or possible. Then each of us has the right of choice on how we manage our lives within these new boundaries. Uh, meantime, Yag Mom is watching from Edmonton, I assume, says, I, I feel like the under 12s, the kids are being ignored in all of this. Like you just said, Doc, you know, who's protecting them? She says, as a parent of a six year old with asthma, you know, we've kept them home all year. I'm even more concerned for her health. I don't want her saddled. Nice play on words with long covid because our government wants the stampede to go ahead. Um, I mean, these, the, these are parents that are concerned. I mean, six year old has asthma. Obviously, it's something front of mind. Doctor, then we haven't even talked to you about long covid. I mean, you know, you've been participating. I know that you participated in a, a, a Zoom webinar just a short time ago about the long haul stories of perseverance and recovery from COVID-19 put on by the Edmonton Zone Medical Staff Association. If, if we if we do some quick math, uh, you know, along the themes of my unscientific approach this morning, but we recognize that approximately a million Canadians have had COVID, approximately 10 percent of COVID survivors will be the so-called long haulers, approximately then. At least 100,000 Canadians will live with long COVID. Now, I'm asking you to look into the crystal ball because we're not there yet. We're not in the future yet. We can we can look back, and I think of my Uncle Keith, who's lived with the impact of polio uh, on his body for, for many decades. That's sort of one reference point I might have. But but what do we expect to see? What are the expected implications for, for more than 100,000 Canadians? 
you know, certainly what we've heard and what we've seen so far from the long haulers is that they have multiple flares. This goes on for many months. Um, they're seeking healthcare resources. They're going to the emergency room. They're unable to work like they used to be able to work. Um, they're unable to participate in, in their daily activities. I mean, we had one of the survivors on there who's um, a successful lawyer and she's barely able to stand in the courtroom for, for short periods of time because of some of the symptoms she's experiencing from long COVID. Uh, we had a marathon runner who was barely able to run a couple of kilometers for weeks and weeks after she had COVID because of this, this long COVID syndrome. Um, I mean, you know, we're looking at um, effects not only on the healthcare system, on the economy, because these sufferers may not be able to productively work. Uh, we're looking at severe impacts on their quality of life because they may not be able to participate in their daily activities and social activities. Their relationships are impacted. There's so much unknown about long COVID. And this is one of the many, many reasons to take a cautious approach in a pandemic. Um, and, you know, to address that tweet about, uh, you know, as individuals, we can choose what we want to participate in and, and not want to participate in, regardless of what the public health measures are. The problem is that many people don't have a choice. I mean, people have to work. And so many people have to send their kids to school. They have to send their children to daycare. And inherently, when you open up, um, when you open up the community and community transmission increases, Every activity that individuals do become increased risk. Um, going to daycare becomes increased risk. Going to school becomes increased risk. Um, going to work becomes increased risk for our essential workers that work in those factories with poor ventilation and improper PPE. Um, and so there's many things that we don't have a choice to participate in as individuals. We have to do. Um, we have to get groceries. We have to work and we need childcare. And so those things inherently put all of us at risk when, when we open up too soon and community transmission increases. Doctor, we uh, so greatly appreciate your time on this. Um, I know you've got a day to get to with uh, some pretty important commitments. Is there anything I haven't asked you about in closing that you think is relevant or important? We always want these interviews to be up to the minute, to have people focused on what they need to be focusing on. Have we covered everything uh, relatively important at this point, or, or is there something you want to mention before we thank you for your time? You know, I think we've covered everything, and I just, but I just want to say kudos to you for talking about ventilation, because that's something that's been uh, under the radar for so long. And so, you know, mentioning to people that we need to, uh, you know, really pay attention to what places are well ventilated, making sure now that it's summer, that windows are open, and also making sure that we have proper PPE, proper masks that are working, um, especially for those essential workers. Hopefully they're getting respirators, N95s to prevent transmission. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I just wanted to congratulate you on talking about those things and uh, thank you for having me, Ryan. It's well, always a pleasure. You're always welcome on this show, Doctor. We, we greatly appreciate your time. Uh, Dr. Thaisin Letha is a, a pediatrician, uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Alberta. Thanks again. And make sure to give her a follow on Twitter, by the way. Uh, Real Talkers, of course, every morning, uh, right around 8 o'clock-ish, I release... Uh, we release our lineup for, for that day's show and, and we let you know who's coming up and from time to time. And we're probably going to start doing this more frequently. Sarah and I have been talking. We like the idea of of the odd Twitter poll, maybe even every morning. Who knows? Why not? I mean, really, well, I'll tell you why not. Is Sometimes I'm lazy. But other than that, other than my own personal laziness, there's really no reason why we wouldn't put a poll out there. Uh, we've got about uh, coming up on 650 votes on our poll this morning. How do you feel about Alberta's reopening plan? Uh, you know, uh, when it comes to it's about time, the it's about time crew represents about 12 percent of our respondents at this point. Uh, it's been up for just under an hour, uh, about 20 percent, 19.7 percent are torn. One in five are torn and about 68 percent say that, quite frankly, it's too soon. Uh, we encourage you to leave a comment there. We're also seeing comments, of course, on our live chat this morning. You're, you're letting us know, you know, how you feel about the opening. I think there have been some good comments uh, from people that have, that have that have indicated, you know, for example, that you know the, the stampede is something that that you know Jennifer says, for example, I don't want to judge the opening just on the stampede. You know, let's see what the plan is for that. 
Not a fan, she says, of Stampede anyway, although I am happily awaiting the chance to, to attend a family gathering to celebrate all that was missed. The opening of outdoor sports for youth. Those are things I think I, I might be stating the obvious, uh, Sarah, but but the upset, not the obsession, but the, the the well, maybe it's a fair word. I mean, the big spotlight that's being cast on the Calgary Stampede and the premier did make a token mention of Edmonton's Folk Fest. Yesterday as well, mentioned Edmonton's Folk Fest. If you're going to mention something from Calgary, you better mention something from Edmonton. But that seems to be almost the the, the, the single most important reason to reopen. And we're, we're seeing comment after comment from audience members that are saying, I'd be happy to introduce my newborn to her grandmother for the first time. Absolutely. I, I think also in that announcement with... Uh, from Kenny yesterday, I mean, he he definitely took the opportunity to say that, you know, Edmonton Folk Fest can't go forward because it requires long-term planning, whereas the Stampede is definitely a go. Um, and I'm interested to see the the stress on one vaccine. So in a way, I'm kind of like, oh, fantastic. There's kind of this encouragement to get vaccinated, at least the first dose. You know, if we can get there... But I think then there's also the point that, you know, we're already where we need to be for the June 1st opening. I just want to flag that June 1st is less than a week away. So it it makes it seem like it's, you know, we've still got a bit of time. But I mean, looking forward, it's been less than a week since schools, since kids went back to school. We're not even a month from the spike that we had the yellow branding for, and now we moved on to the pink branding mm-hmm. for the summer, the best summer ever. Um, that it's I'm disappointed there weren't tank tops. <laughs> I feel like there should be branded tank tops. There should have been like beach umbrellas on the stage with him. Beach instead of umbrella. Flags. Well, or, or like, uh, like uh, the, the mechanical bulls, maybe. <laughs> maybe the premier could have made the announcement riding a mechanical bull, wearing a best summer ever tank Wait. top. And, of course, the cowboy hat. He's got to leave something to do next time. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. For stage two. When you announce stage two. Or phase two. wave four. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, maybe that'll be it. You go back to, like, the pink and teal branding, and you can come in on a surfboard. And, you know, ride wave four or something like that. The fourth wave. Uh, Mike wrote in. He sent us an email to talk at RyanJesperson.com. He says, it's a quick rant, Ryan. He says, you know, you can read it today if you like. Probably not tomorrow. He says, it's probably not trash talk worthy. Uh, it's good, Mike. It allows me to keep my voice normal. He says, I'm I'm fully convinced that uh, the premier shut down the legislature solely to have his catchphrase war room come up with some new slogans and signs every time there's an announcement. Wrote, Most recently, it's Alberta open for summer. Mike says, I wonder what it'll get backtracked to if we hit, get hit with more cases, especially after the long weekend, the May long weekend. He says, mind blowing that from Mike. Haas says, okay, well, now let's hear an expert that supports opening, that supports opening. Um, I mean, I I guess I I could go through my physician's uh, phone book and call hundreds of them until I find one that thinks it's a great idea to blow things uh, wide open right now. But we bring on medical professionals that give nonpartisan medical evidence-based scientific advice. Uh, You can take it or leave it if you like. Uh, We provide an opportunity for you to leave comments. We provide an open-ended Twitter poll for you to expand on reasons why you might have mixed feelings about the reopening. And of course, we're wide open to your feedback uh, by way of our hashtag RealTalkRJ powered by Park Power. If you go to parkpower.ca right now, you're going to notice that if you sign up to have them provide you with their internet, uh, your internet, electricity, or natural gas, you have you have an opportunity to enter a promo code. The promo code, and you're going to want to write it down to remember it because it's worth 70 bucks is 2021 dash real talk whether it's a commercial account or a residential account you know you can pick whoever your provider is 70 bucks off your first bill with the promo code 2021 dash real talk at parkpower.ca the team at todd's mechanical is named todd and he's a beauty I've had friends reach out to me. Some of them have said, you can use my name on Real Talk. Others have said, well, don't mention me on Real Talk. And I've said, well, boy, aren't you important? You don't want your name mentioned on Real Talk. Are you afraid you're going to get an influx of calls like Todd is? The point is, everybody's been taking my advice to, to either punch Todd's number into your phone or to write it down on a piece of paper. Because when every single one of these folks, friends of mine, personal friends of mine, have had all hell break loose at a moment's notice, which is always how it goes... Your house doesn't sort of give you a heads up and say, hey, three weeks from now, 
your drywall's going to start to bubble and get a little bit soft. Three weeks from now, we're going to relax the connections between the plumbing and the pipes are going to start to sweat. Just a heads up. No, they'll wait till it's the most inconvenient possible time. And that's when Todd will make time for you. His number is 780-499-7598. That's 780-499-7598. He's Edmonton's best plumber. His web reviews reiterate that. And he has the Real Talk stamp of approval at Todd's Mechanical. Also, a big shout out to the teams at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. We're talking about the DQs at Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road. Sarah going above and beyond the other day, responding to a viewer who wrote in, who emailed in asking for the addresses of the locations because she said, I'm at least 15 minutes away from a Dairy Queen and I want to make sure that I get to a Real Talk Dairy Queen because we have a hankering for Peanut Buster Parfaits. They're $1.99. These are the ones with that rich, it's like the creamy vanilla soft serve and the rich hot fudge. And of course, the peanuts, the Dairy Queen trademark curl, and of course, that classic red spoon a dollar 99 if you mention real talker jespo thanks to our friend brianna we know they are two for 420 at the dairy queens of northwest edmonton and sherwood park i wanted to bring you another minute or so of uh, the premier's uh, availability i recognize that people are watching from other parts of the country and i think probably keeping a keen eye on alberta's reopening plan because it is the quickest it's the most ambitious in canada and it's, it's a jurisdiction that's that struggled uh, quite recently over the past six months or so most especially with covid19 now jason kenny took reporters questions yesterday as he as he later described those journalists in his fireside chat the elite mainstream media so he took supporters questions and, and maybe a question from a detractor or two last night here's a portion of what the premier had to say those folks who are arguing against a careful plan to open up are really saying to the, vac- to the vaccine uh, hesitant, don't bother. There's really no benefit. It doesn't really uh, protect people. It doesn't really protect the healthcare system or protect lives. Stay uh, huddled in your basement uh, indefinitely. You know, that's the worst possible message to send. Let me tell you this. I, I hope I've asked our health department to approach, in fact, the Calgary Stampede to talk about a vaccine clinic at the Stampede. Um, if, if people, are, you know, younger people who might be less likely to go to the logistical hassle of making an appointment tend to come out to the Midway and to Stampede, if we can get them in a queue at, and, and, they, and they can get their jab and we get that extra person, those extra thousands of people vaccinated, that's a health advantage. So I say, let's celebrate what we're achieving as a province. Let's do it with a sense of, of hope uh, and optimism and unity. And unity, says uh, Premier Jason Kenny. Jennifer on our live chat says he did say that those of us that are not convinced can, quote, hovel in our basements in fear. So that's encouraging. It's all spin. It's obviously spin. And the premier, is, he's got this, this smile on his face, right? It's, it's the Jason Kenny smile, the smile that comes with a whole bunch of promises. And the smile indicates that, that we're through the woods, that Albertans have been crushing it and we're through the woods. Some of you have been crushing it. Some of you have been doing an amazing job. And, 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 and others of you have, have been, quite frankly, stretching this out and, and making it more of an issue, more of a problem and more of a challenge. And I think that that's what a lot of people are, are concerned about. I think that's why people are concerned today, because the fear is, is that events like the Calgary Stampede could, could create an entirely new problem. Now, the minute that I mentioned that a reliable source has indicated to us that some members of the Stampede Board are absolutely appalled, that it's not good in that room right now, at their name being invoked, at their event being so directly tied to this reopening plan. And many of you have said, hey, listen, if the Stampede doesn't want to appear like they're part of this, they'd better speak up and they'd better speak up quickly. Now, the message must be massaged, right? What does it have to look like? Is it the stampede implementing an employer policy that anybody that's going to work that midway must have a double dose of the vaccine? Is it potentially uh, the inclusion or the introduction of some sort of a vaccine clinic? The premier suggested this yesterday. So young people that might not typically put in the effort or go to the the trouble to book vaccine appointments could, could show up at the stampede and get their vaccination on time. Whatever it is, you have to expect that it probably today the Calgary Stampede will make some sort of announcement to, to quell the concerns 
of folks like Edwin. Edwin's uh, got a great sense of humor. He's also a graphic designer, and, and he's released this T-shirt design. You can let me know what you think about this. He says the Calgary Stampede, he's, he's going back to the devastating floods. Everybody remembers the floods. When the Calgary Stampede was back, I remember I worked at that Calgary Stampede. I covered it when I was back working in television. I still have my come hell or high water t-shirt well edwin is proposing calgary stampede come hell or high fever and that to me is one example of many on the the liability that this could be when it comes to public impression and keep in mind the calgary stampede i mean i don't want to open too many cans of worms all at once here but the stampede has its has its own cans of worms that it deals with every single year, right? It's going to get the rodeo protests. It's the you know horse is going to die during the the Rangeland Derby, and I'm a fan of the Chucks. I'm not taking a, a strong position on that. I understand some people have zero tolerance for Chuck wagon racing. Um, I'm not one of them, and I'm happy to talk about that. But that's not the point. The point is the Calgary Stampede is no stranger to managing delicate public relations challenges. This might be. This probably is the biggest one. It should. It will be very interesting to see what they uh, say because I feel like they they're kind of being backed into a corner where they need to say something, um, and yeah, I I don't envy them. I uh, the talk of you know the the shirt. There's also a comment about from Andrew Dupree on the live chat about best summer ever masks. Yeah, um, which would be would be great. I, I also on the live chat, Kaylin points out that you know if you go to the stampede and you're going to have that clinic to get a jab at the at the stampede you're not protected you'd have to you know the stampede would have to then be running two weeks from at that point it sounds to me like the type of thing where you'd roll out something pretty ambitious these types of clinics or pop-ups maybe two weeks ahead but again like how much how many times have we said calgary stampede this morning this isn't about the fucking Calgary Stampede. This is about a province of four and a half million people. This is about thousands of businesses, right? Like, you know, I mean, uh, one one viewer this morning, I'm probably going to lose it, but uh, here it is. Mariah says, I don't, I don't understand why the premier can't just be general about being able to have mm-hmm. events, right? Something that communicates to all of Alberta, right? Not just the two major cities or not just southern Alberta. Troy says the Stampede doesn't want to be known for this political posturing, I only read the first sentence Uh, to do Troy justice. I will read his second sentence. He says they want to be known for what they've always been known for horse deaths. Um, Ding, dang, dong. Ding, dang, dong. I know not not everybody loves. I love the Calgary Stampede. I understand that rodeo is, is very divisive. I personally am a fan of rodeo. I understand why some people hate the rodeo. The rodeo, unfortunately, because of a couple yahoos, rodeo has been weaponized rodeo i mean if you're there are so many proud rodeo families so many unbelievable rodeo supporters rodeo has been a um, a bastion of and an indicator of and a metaphor for community for many decades alberta's built on many traditions one of which is what guy uh, you know guy Wiedek put in place more than 100 years ago the calgary stampede like an unbelievable tradition um rodeo has been special to a lot of people i have some wonderful rodeo memories uh, rodeo this year has come to represent something very different Right. Along the lines of Rachel Notley's embarrassing cousins comment several years ago, people that have been attending these renegade rodeos that, again, have not been supported by any governing bodies, any rodeo organizations that are worth their salt. They've 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 taken tepid, small steps to distance themselves from that. I haven't seen any participants sanctioned. I haven't seen any stock providers sanctioned. Uh, But you never know what might happen. It's unfortunate because uh, these days. And you can see how I'm dancing around this. These days, if you're going to go on record and say, I can't wait to attend a rodeo, I love the rodeo, people are automatically going to make some assumptions about how you feel about public health, Mm. about probably how you feel about masks and vaccines, which is really unfortunate and probably not accurate. But some people are working pretty hard to have rodeo earn that stigma. I think that's really too bad. So we'll see what the Calgary Stampede says today. I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised. You know, Shauna says this seems pretty deliberate since rodeo was was declared Alberta's official sport. I don't think that actually went through. I think it was a proposal, wasn't it? It was like a floated proposal. I don't. Do you remember, Sam? I don't think that it It was tabled in the legislature. Yeah. I don't know because it was a it was a private members bill. right? Yeah. Well, like, you remember yeah. who first tabled that? 
in the Alberta legislature. Oh, God. Wasn't, wasn't that it? Jim Prentice a while ago? Or? Uh, not quite. Oh, you got to think oh, even further back. Further former, back. Former leader of the Alberta Liberal Party tabled it. Kevin Taft. Kevin Taft. I remember that. Kevin Taft. And, My, when, yeah. and when Kevin Taft suggested that rodeo be named Alberta's official sport, every progressive conservative called him basically the biggest buffoon in the province. They thought it was a terrible idea. Alberta's provincial sport is being jealous of Quebec. That's what it is. <laughs> oh, geez. Here we go. <laughs> I just, just when I thought we'd open all the cans, just thought when I'd open, Sam goes ahead and opens up another one. I just really appreciate people pointing to the fact that it's actually about, and I think it would have been stronger messaging around families and seeing, uh, you know, your chosen family, your, your, your relatives, uh, whomever, the people that matter to you most that resonates with everyone uh it it's it's just as kind of a head scratcher that the the rodeo is being uh put front and center for this um it just it doesn't seem to resonate yeah it just it wouldn't be where i would go mm. <laughs> if you're really trying to get everybody on board um yeah but families don't donate to the ucp party and and families aren't you know necessarily the uh, the people that are lobbying the government super hard they're they're definitely sending a message to a certain demographic yeah i mean yeah i mean but they all whatever. Have we don't families. need to, we don't need to dig on this a lot a lot of families donate to the ucp i mean they they, they have they, they've been lagging behind the ndp in fundraising right now uh, but a lot of families do support the ucp that's you know but but yeah i mean t- even just the fact that people right now are that this is on people's minds who's he speaking to who's he pandering to who who is he indicating the top priorities are, are, are recognizing like mm. these types of things people are talking about it and, and we're in and a pandemic we're in a pandemic and yet we're talking about some specific sport and yeah. it's like no no let's refocus let's let focus here people pandemic like if you don't care at all about the Calgary Stampede, or if you don't care at all about public events, or if you don't, yeah, for people that care about their families, for people that care about their businesses, you might feel like you were being somewhat overlooked or neglected. It's like we went, I, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to think of what an example, may, I don't even know what the example might be. It's like, maybe it's something that's kind of cute and naive, like when you, when you tie your little guy's skates for the first time, and he skates out, and as he falls onto his butt the first time the blades hit the ice, he starts talking about who he's going to hand the Stanley Cup to after he accepts it from Gary Bettman. And you go, well, there's a few steps in between learning to skate and hoisting the Stanley Cup. I don't know. You know, my metaphors always go to hockey and sports, but that's what it kind of feels like. We're, we're, we, it seems to be we're ignoring a lot of steps. Um, we're asking you, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ryan Jesperson. How do you feel about Alberta's reopening plan? We've got about 830 votes right now, and the numbers are holding steady. 68% right now say it's too soon. Uh, 19% say you're torn. With You've left comments. You can read those on my profile. And about 13% of you say it's about time. Uh, I want to bring you what uh, Oilers defenseman Ethan Bear had to say yesterday. In just a moment, right now, I want to remind you that the team at Friesen Brothers knows that with the advent of May Long Weekend and beyond, we are now officially into grilling season. And you've got your license to grill. So with your skills and their offerings combined, it's going to be a formidable summer season when it comes to what you're putting in front of your family. Friesen Brothers, for more than 65 years, has been family-owned, Alberta-grown, and Alberta-owned, supporting Alberta producers. Everything from their fresh produce, Alberta-milled flour when it comes to their famous sourdough, and, of course, all the proteins that you've come to expect, including unbelievable Alberta beef. They're real butchers, do an amazing job visit Banja's smokehouse in the store you'll know if it's fired up when you walk in there it's absolutely stunning the jespo recommendation the braised beef short rib you can find friesen brothers at 15 locations across the province of alberta and of course link to their website under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com that's also where you'll find the team at sherwood and st albert dodge they've got a lot of their inventory online you can take a look or of course they observe all covid19 protocols you can come visit them at their two dealerships including that brand new beauty beautiful one that's just over a year old in fact in st albert i was out there the other day and i saw that new jeep wrangler 4 by e the electric wrangler 4 by 4 unbelievable I had a chance to drive it just around the parking lot can't even hear this thing it's fascinating they got me into a new grand cherokee i'm loving it per- perfect for our family for the summer to get outdoors and escape it all you can find the best selection in the province at st albert and sherwood dodge 
Yesterday, we touched on a, a pretty disappointing, uh, st- that's not a strong enough word, a, a disgusting story after the disappointment of the Oilers getting swept in four games by the Winnipeg Jets. It turns out that Oilers' young defenseman, Ethan Bear, a proud indigenous man, had been subjected to racist attacks online. I shared my thoughts with you yesterday. yesterday. Many of you have been in touch, including Janice. I'm going to get to her email in just a moment. But but Ethan Bear, if you can imagine a professional athlete and a human being who's processing the disappointment of that premature end to that playoff run, having to strap on a, we call it a lavalier mic, having to step in front of the cameras and release a video so shortly after. I can't even imagine what it's like for this guy, but but like he does with charging wingers coming in on a two-on-one, he stared that camera right in the eyes, and he and his partner in life had this to say. Hello, everyone. It's Ethan Bear here in Rogers Place on Tree Six territory, home of the Edmonton Oilers. We just came off a hard-fought series. We didn't get the result we wanted, but the guys all left it all on the line. As you've known, I've been subject to racist behavior on social media, and I know this doesn't represent all Oilers fans or hockey fans, and I greatly appreciate your support and your love during this time. I'm here to stand up to this behavior, to these comments. I'm proud of where I come from. I'm proud to be from Ochapa's First Nation. And I'm not just doing this for myself. I'm doing this for all people of color. I'm doing this for the next generation, to help make change, to love one another, to support one another, to be kind to each other. There's no place for racism in in our communities, in sports, or in our workplace. So I call on all of us to help make change and to end racism. We all deserve to be treated fairly. And at the end of the day, I think we'll get there. Hello, my name is Laneige Ned, and I'm here today to support Ethan on the matters of racism. Um, I'm wanting to make a positive change in our community and create a voice for Indigenous youth to stand up to these sort of stereotypes and remarks towards our people. Me and Ethan are wanting to use his platform as a way to make a shift in young Indigenous and children of colors experiences growing up so that they don't have to endure what we had to experience. We are really overwhelmed with all of the love and support and kind words we are receiving, but it's time to make a change. It's time to educate ourselves on these matters and stand up to racism. That's Oilers uh, defenseman Ethan Bear and uh, his partner, Lanasia Ned. Uh, that comment released by way of Oilers social media yesterday. Janice took the time to send us an email. Many of you did. Uh, I really appreciate Janice's sentiment. She says, uh, it's talk at ryanjesperson.com, by the way. She says, you know, you, you recently ha- had, Ryan, on, on the, the one-year anniversary of George Floyd's death, George Floyd's murder, the where are we now one year later conversation on that real talk round table janice says i can tell you as an indigenous person that things haven't changed she says it's all talk and it's no action i've seen allies sign petitions and share posts and even march against racism yet when it happens online allies don't seem to call it out it's passively almost accepted by people moderating fan pages and and, and even moderators themselves She says, of course, I'm talking about all the racist comments. It was not an isolated comment, by the way. She says, I'm talking about all the racist comments uh, aimed at Ethan Bear, coming from so-called true Oilers fans on these Facebook pages and tweets and and posts over the past number of days. And I've actually, says Janice, had to remove myself from these fan pages because of the disgusting vitriol that is outright racism against this indigenous hockey player. She says, I get people are upset about being out of the playoffs. It's, it's not Ethan Bear's fault entirely. This whole year, you know, he's, he's put up with being slammed and ridiculed and harshly criticized by fans. It seems to me to be more than any other player. When he's good, he's never good enough. And when he's down, they call him the worst player ever. And every single time, every single time, she says, all caps, race enters the discussion. I don't see that with other players who are, who are not black or indigenous people of color. It's disgusting. She says, but this is what always happens to our indigenous players. It's just on a larger stage. And now 
reports that he's being physically threatened. She says, you want to know, Ryan, where we are one year later? Check out Oilers fan Facebook pages. It'll show you very clearly that we have a long way to go. She says, Ethan Bear has been a role model for the indigenous community. It was such an honor to see him wear that Oilers sweater with such pride. He's brought so much hope to other kids who may have all the talent, but not all of the opportunity. He gives back to young people, and he always makes us proud to call him one of our own. He's young, and he'll learn from this loss. So will the rest of the team. But one lesson that Ethan already knows all too well is that racism comes with being an indigenous role model. So my hope is that when allies see this, call it out. Say it's wrong. Say why it's wrong. Block people from the fan pages. Report them if necessary. Allies can help. Janice says when when another white person says it, for some reason, it means more. No idea why, but it's exhausting. Thanks to the Real Talk community, says Janice. I appreciate that. That's an email I keep. That's one that I keep with me. I have a file of emails that I keep. And every once in a while, in the quiet moments, I go back and I read those ones to remind me why we're doing what we're doing and who's joining us every morning in community. And we really appreciate it. We're going to lighten up in just a second. We don't mind getting heavy. We don't mind talking about stuff that really matters. We also have some fun here on the show every once in a while. And we're going to learn about Cat Fest. Uh, not right now, but in just a quick second. First, I need to remind you that the team at Kubi Energy, every single Monday, unless it's a long weekend, then it's on Tuesday, our first show of the week pre- presents positive reflections. And something's going on. Have you noticed, Sarah, with Real Talkers this week, we're getting more positive reflection submissions than we've had, I think, ever before. People are, something's happening. I think maybe Kipper. Kipper's how? Kipper the Beagle. Yeah. That might have been it. It's true. Yeah. I think you just hit the nail on the head. People are people are starting to connect with positive reflections, realizing that as we gather together and kick off our weeks, we could do it with such a boost. And Kubi Energy has been a part of that since the very beginning. I talked to Jake just the other day. They are pedal to the metal right now. Uh, I, I should probably find some sort of an EV as opposed to a fossil fuel powered metaphor to use for the solar company. Because it uh, doesn't, EVs don't make a sound. And what do I just say? Things are heating up. Jake was reflecting on the business and, and, letting, and letting us know that their team of Tesla certified installers, all electricians or electrical apprentices are hard at work. They're based out of Kamloops and Edmonton. So if you're in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, they've got you covered. Commercial, residential, industrial, the team at Kubi Energy wants your business as you move to a more sustainable model. The team at Local Waste also loves a little presentation that they sponsor. That's Friday as we wrap up our broadcast week, a little something we call Trash Talk. You can get something off your chest. I suspect this week there may be a certain theme, but we encourage you to branch out, blow off steam wherever you need. You can submit your Trash Talk emails to talk at ryanjesperson.com. The team at Local Waste loves to talk trash. They've been doing it for more than a quarter century, locally owned, going toe-to-toe against the big multinationals. They've got a team at local waste that in a complimentary fashion can work with you to get you out of a bad contract with one of their competitors. That's right. They'll go to bat for you so you can spend less and find a better fit for where your business is at. Local Waste Services, you'll find them online at localwaste.ca. So you know that this audience, I shouldn't say that. As a matter of fact, I'd like to take it back before the sentence is even out of my mouth. The, the team here in the Real Talk studio, we're big fans of dogs, but that doesn't mean we don't have time in our lives for cats. As a matter of fact, I bet you a whole bunch of our audience members are, 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 are so big on cats that I don't even have to tell you that coming up on May 29th and May 30th at EdmontonCatFest.com, you're going to have a chance to participate in what is quite likely the world's greatest cat festival. Linda Huang is the founder of the Edmonton International Cat Festival. Gabriella Smith is a researcher that will be participating in this year's event. And it is a real thrill to welcome you both to Real Talk. A good morning to you and welcome. Hi, Ryan. Linda, I know that this is going to be a pun-ridden conversation. I know that, you know... (laughs) We're gonna dig our paws into this, and 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 we're gonna and we're gonna and, and we're gonna have a lot of fun. But but let's start off with just some of the the, the basic background here. Catfest, you're the founder. 
How did this all come about? This is, I mean, this is a personal passion to say the very least, isn't it? Yeah, so this is an entirely volunteer run festival. We started in 2014, um, basically as a way to celebrate cats, celebrate cat people and raise money for cat rescues. And you know, Edmonton, typically uh, our summers were the festival city, festival summers. So we wanted, there's only two. <laughs> We're a very niche, uh, niche community here, um, but we we've been recognized internationally um, as one of the festivals to go to for cat lovers, pet lovers around the world. So that's been really exciting. And it's just like it's just such a potty, <laughs> Ryan. And we just have such a good time. There's educational content, entertaining stuff, hands on things, cat vendors. That's all the physical event. But actually, we've been able to transport all these things online as well. So you'll get all of that uh, over this weekend um, too. <laughs> so it's gonna it, it, it's a virtual event. Obviously, is this is this the first virtual event that you've done for Cat Fest? We actually we actually did go virtual last year because of the pandemic. Um, this is the first time we've gone both days of the weekend. So we've always only been on Catterday, but we decided with virtual we can spread the love over the weekend. Um, and then this year we're also doing three weeks of recordings. So knowing if you're not going to sit at your computer all day, both days, you can binge Cat Fest on your own time for Ooh. weeks to come. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. And then uh, we also have put together Alberta's first cat themed online marketplace so people can do one stop cat themed shopping for everything you could imagine. Cat clothes, cat art, cat pins, cat cat everything. You can uh, buy it all in one spot on our website um, over the weekend. <laughs> OK, <as well. laughs> Gabriella, you've, you've got a you've got a grad degree uh, from Hunter College, a grad degree in animal behavior and conservation. You have, have mm -hmm. literally written the book on this. Your book, If I Fits, I Sits, a citizen <laughs> science investigation into illusory contour susceptibility in domestic cats. Uh, really, as I dig into that, I, I, I go, I hope that I pronounced everything correctly in the title of the book, let alone understanding what it's all about. Have you planted a flag? I mean, did you plant a flag early on in life? Dogs v. cats? Is this, does this need to be a divisive conversation from your perspective? Uh, no, that conversation happened before I even entered the scene. It is an age-old <laughs> debate, isn't it? No, it's it's just been cats are so quirky and they're so funny and we celebrate them for that. And it also introduces a very interesting way to think about how to study them. Uh, and so I was thinking, you know, cats do really funny things. How can we harness that to learn about their cognition? And in the case of this paper, uh, learn about their vision. Can you tell us about your research uh, specifically into cats? Do, do, am I understanding correctly that you, you performed a, a citizen science study with the Hunter College Thinking Dog Center? Can you, help, can, can you tell us what you did? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the Thinking Dog Center is through Hunter College. And the third author on the paper is the um, principal investigator, the um, PI, Sarah B. What do dogs see? Are they susceptible to certain illusions? So I attended this lecture and I returned back to my sixth floor walk up in New York City and sat down on the floor with my roommate's cat. And uh, I was thinking, well, Twitter told me that cats will sit on shapes on the floor. I wonder if there's a type of optical illusion that looks like a square. And so I quickly wrote to Sarah and I was like, you know, these two thoughts came together. You know, is this a thing? And she said, we need to do this. Uh, and so it just made sense to be a citizen science study uh, based on the pandemic actually happened, you know, right when we were thinking about performing this study. And so, you know, we flirted with the idea of having it go through the Thinking Dog Center, which studies dogs, uh, but it didn't make sense for the pandemic. And also because research suggests that cats may not behave, uh, you know, most cat-like or most organically, when they're in a lab setting. So it kind of became perfect for cats that this was being performed at home and citizen scientists just dove right into it because everyone was sitting at home looking at their pets. And uh, so we conducted the study over the um, summer of 2020. And uh, I watched lots of videos of cats walking around shapes on the floor. <laughs> you're, you're probably the only person here out of all three that, that sat around watching cat videos all day. Hey, I, I mean, I, I can't imagine that Linda would ever. <laughs> I don't imagine that that ever happens, Linda. No, no, nobody really spends time watching cat videos, do they? 
No. No. <laughs> no. It's a very niche. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very niche. Yeah. Like literally, there's cat videos with like a billion and a half views. Uh, I'm probably <laughs> underestimating. I think cat. It doesn't matter. The the smartest interview that you'll ever do, the biggest guest you'll ever secure doing a talk show. It doesn't matter. Your numbers will never stack up against cat videos. <laughs> Um, a, a cat can a cat can be batting away catnip or a ball of yarn for forty minutes, and people will watch it more than they'll watch our show. Um, it's not that I'm bitter. It's not that I'm bitter. I'm just fascinated. It's people love their cats. So Gabrielle, so you published this paper. If I fits, I sits. What ultimately would you say? Like if we could, if we could nail it down um, to one takeaway, what did this exercise or this citizen study? What did it reiterate to you, or what did you learn about cats? We learned that cats see the optical illusion, which is called the Kinitsa square. They see the Kinitsa square as humans do, and they will spontaneously sit in the illusion as they will spontaneously sit in a real square. It also uh, is an excellent example of the efficacy of cat cognition in the context of citizen science. It's the first cat cognition citizen science experiment. So the, the results are twofold in that sense. Linda, do you have, uh, I don't mean to keep making this about dogs. My bias is clearly showing through. Do you have, uh. a, do you have, a, do you have a dog in your house? I've got two, Ryan. You, you have two I, dogs? I love both. Okay, well, I'm not going to ask yeah. you to, I'm not going to ask you to pick and choose, but I am going to ask you to, to make a definitive statement here. Do you believe cats to be smarter than dogs? Yes. <laughs> You paused. I will. I will say that. Did, did you? Well, did did you, you know, pause? Because it's a tough decision. Or obviously, be- <laughs> some. Well, all, honestly, both dogs are right at my feet, so I just oh, don't want yeah. them to get upset with me. <laughs> They're gonna hear you. Yeah. yeah. But some dogs are very intelligent. I mean, it's like anything. You know, I think maybe we can't cast a paintbrush across the whole species. Is that some cats are very smart, some dogs are very smart, some people are very smart, and then others are not. So, um, but I do think cats very much know what they're doing. They're very, they're very, very intentional with uh, with how they basically mold. I think. Um, their parents <laughs> uh, into exactly what they want. But I know my cats are smart. They sit for treats. They, they know, you know, routines, they have habits. Um, yeah. I, I, but you know, this isn't a dogs against cats situation, right? If you're trying to draw well, up some controversy, you, you, can, you can tell me whatever you like. I ultimately, I will determine whether or not this turns into a dogs V cats, because after we talk, when you sign off, I might turn this into some sort of a divisive exercise. We're all trying to distract ourselves from problems in life and, and cat fest is working, but not just not in the direction you thought. Um, no, the thing I, I think, I think cats are beautiful. I love watching. I will watch a cat and it reminds me, it's like a mini, it's like a miniature lion. I mean, I, mean, I love watching cats. They were, but I also think if I had a cat, I wouldn't be a hundred. Put it this way: I never suspect that my dogs are going to kill me in my sleep. And <laughs> and with cats, I just don't know. Like Colette on our live chat, Colette says dogs are so needy. She says I find them exhausting. <laughs> Colette says cat cat. She says cats can take you or leave you, but they can give love too, and they're super cute. So, to me, Colette has. <laughs> And that's great. That's a great comment. But but Colette, they can take you or leave you. That doesn't work for me. I don't like an animal. I want my animal to have <laughs> unconditional love. No, you have to work for the love. Oh, yeah. I mean that you know that that sounds exhausting to me. Uh, I don't know. I mean Gab- Gabrielle, you know all about this. Yeah. Go ahead, Linda. I just wanted, if you did want to do, do something divisive, hold on, how do yeah. I do this here? Yeah, there you um, go. I would say that our cat fest, our cat fest mugs, let's say, are better than uh, real talk mugs. Well, I, I, are you are you trying to are you are you trying to have the segment end early or what's your what what's your goal what's your ultimate goal here? <laughs> let's, let's go back to Gabrielle. Yeah, I just want to show off the mug. <laughs> Those are actually phenomenal mugs, and if and if you do one with a with a boxer's face on it, I will buy one for sure, Linda. But you know, I'm coming across. I'm painting myself into a corner facetiously because I actually think cats are fascinating. I, I just don't happen to have one. Um, but Gabriella, this is this is the type of thing where like a, a cat fest. I mean, you have your specific research paper, and people are gonna. I mean, people are writing in right now in our live chat. They're going like, "This is fascinating. This is absolutely amazing." But the thing about it is Linda's found a way to build an entire festival around one animal, which says a lot about 
the cat. What, what, what is it about this magnificent animal that really has captured your attention in the way that it has beyond this specific, I don't want to call it a niche research study that you did, but there's a whole lot more to them than, than what you've published. Yeah, I'm really interested in how domestication has or has not shaped their behavior. And like you said, they kind of are like little lions. They have a lot more ingrained instincts that they rely on. Um, Like I said before, these quirky behaviors like purring and chirping and kneading, you know, what are these things? They're likely instincts are likely uh, residual from at some point in the wild. And I think, you know, animal cognition behavior has been so training heavy and it's served a lot of research and, and uh, you know, discoveries, but I get really excited about what about the animals that kind of aren't motivated to be trained? You know, they kind of haven't been explored all that much. And so cats just kind of seem like the perfect opportunity because they can be trained if, they want to be. And to me, that's like, I'll take it on. I'll take on the challenge. Let me see if I can harness what you do naturally to uh, see what you're thinking about. So that just to me, that challenge just seems very exciting. Yeah, very well said. Greg on our chat says dogs will do whatever you want and cats will do whatever they want, uh, which I think is pretty accurate. That's that's well said. Um, somebody else just just hey, as a shout out to you, Gabriella, somebody says this is like the third time from different sources. I've heard about the I, if I sits, I fit study which is great. You're obviously catching, you're catching, you're catching a lot of of people's attention with this. Nicole says, Hey, you're nobody until you've been ignored by the cat. That from Nicole. Uh, How about this one? Uh, Jillian says, genuine question. And this is going to come with some spicy language to all of our young listeners, earmuffs for the next five seconds. Jillian says, genuine question. Dogs show love a hundred percent of the time. What percent of time do cats spend being loving as opposed to being selfish assholes um what percentage would you say linda honestly i also want to know if that person has a cat because i feel like when you have a cat you you know that your cat loves you so i would say my cat a hundred percent a hundred percent i know in the bottom of my heart (laughs) Sounds so crazy um, that they love me. But like, Ryan, you too, you don't have a cat. And so when you say your perceptions of cats being, you know, assholes are a bit cold and distant, I find that dog, dog only owners, they all say that. But as soon as you get a cat, it's like you're, it's, it's an entirely different perspective. <laughs> can I, can I say that, can I say that being an asshole does not preclude any living being from being very close to me? <laughs> As a matter of fact, <laughs> I, I, I love and hold dear many people that are absolute assholes. So it's not that I'm against the cat, but there, there is something about it. This is, I mean, people are, this is so awesome. I mean, actually, our, our chat's going nuts right now, which is great. Um, you know, but, but people are saying, you know, like, you know, my cat is, you know, Audra says my, one of my cats is, is loving all the time, like 100% of the time comes running when we come home from work. You know, I mean, that's so, you know, uh, Scott says, I heard, as a matter of fact, it was kind of the other way around that cats actually chose humans for domestication which is a good point as well maybe that's a history that's been largely ignored but when it comes to the cat um arnold says i love both but dogs are sadder you know dogs are more sad so here you go uh you know and and shalane says i can't stand the litter box but i like my cats better than my dog in the spring when i have to deal with backyard cleanup which is fair cats are maybe cleaner than dogs is that cats are cleaner than dogs Although we have a black lab think, that cleans yeah. herself like a kitten, so I don't really know what's going on there. <laughs> yeah. So, Gabriella, have we learned anything th- th- through the course of it? Seems almost every interview that's framed uh, over the past you know year and a half has had a COVID nineteen or a pandemic implication to it. Are there any cat storylines here? Maybe people spending more time at home. Maybe cats having less time to themselves. Maybe people having more time to observe behavior of their feline family members. Is, is there a COVID angle that, that you think CADFest, CATFest uh, might highlight this year that maybe wouldn't have been a focus in years past? Yeah, I mean, I certainly haven't read any complaint columns written by cats that they are getting uh, too much attention these days, but I think it's a product of people spending a lot of time with their cats. And that's why the study kind of worked out perfectly. It 
it gave the opportunity for people to interact with their pets in a way that maybe they didn't already. And the Cat Fest really celebrates that. And I think I've, I'm really interested in how kind of these original festivals orig originated from like fancier events where it's like, look at this breed, look at its coat. Uh, and now we're celebrating the relationship. We're celebrating the bond that they have. And I think that is just so, so wonderful. And, uh, and I think the, you know, the research in my research and the festival just go hand in hand because I mean, we just love the animals. We want to celebrate them in some way, whether it's to learn about their minds or to, uh, to, to have a festival about them. I love it. Um, some people are concerned actually that this conversation's, uh, be, become a little bit divisive. Some people are uncomfortable with, <laughs> hey, that's all on me. Linda Linda didn't reach there's out. Enough, and, there's enough division. You, the world, there's enough division in the world, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, in all seriousness, you've, you've raised almost, and I know, Linda, you're going to deflect the attention. You're going to say a whole bunch of people have done it and all that, and, and let's just skip that. <laughs> but you've raised almost $120,000, 117 grand for local cat rescues to help cats in need. 100% of the proceeds from this event uh, will be going to a bunch of different groups, including Little Cats Law, Second Chance Animal Rescue Society, a.k.a. SCARS, and the Alberta Animal Rescue Crew Society. It's May 29th and 30th, as mentioned, and people can learn more at edmontoncatfest.com. If I know you, uh, I know you're a great storyteller, Linda, and a dear friend of mine. I know, obviously, you're going to be able to, 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 to put a couple of the things in front of us, uh, a couple of their offerings that you're pretty excited about this year. What else can people expect? I mean, uh, it's very clear to me right now with regards to our audience that we've got a lot of cat lovers in the house. <laughs> so what can they expect with the Edmonton International Cat Festival? Yeah, so we've got a uh, local chef, Catherine Joel from Get Cooking. She's actually spent like days recipe testing wow. homemade cat food. Really? So that she can walk you through a virtual cooking class to make cat food for your cat. Um, what it is it like, like filet, mi work, filet but, mignon? Uh, yeah, <laughs> filet mignon. Is that what it is? <laughs> Yeah, there is salmon uh, involved. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be a really good one. Uh, more and more people, and I think partly because of the pandemic, because they're at home and they're seeing their cats, um, more and more people are investing in something called catios, which are basically cat patios outside. Um, and they offer safe, basically safe outdoor enrichment. So you want your cats to go outside, you know, naturally they want to be outside, um, but there's all sorts of dangers and things that could happen. And they could be a danger as well, uh, like to birds, for instance. Um, but catios are really a responsible cat owner uh, way to get around all of that. So we're going to have a catios 101 session. And of course, every year we have um, celebrity cat guests, uh, and it's really nice because of, you know, in the virtual format, we're able to have multiple guests. Um, so we have one-eared Uno, who has two million followers on TikTok, doing a QA. and a <laughs> we've got white coffee cat who is from a famous feline family that whole family i think combined has like 10 million followers on the internet uh they're gonna be kind of tuning in um and then uh, we actually have alberta ndp uh, mla janice Irwin. um i think her cat oregano is more popular than she is now uh oregano is gonna be joining us uh, virtually as well um, and the list goes on and on Oreg oregano <laughs> is i can't believe that there's not been a cat that's made an appearance on this in this interview um, I will say oregano has appeared on Real Talk, uh, so I don't know. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're a pretty animal friendly show. If you want to have, you know, if you want to introduce your cats, that's completely fine. I, I, Linda, this is so rude of me to do this. I would never ask you this. I would never ask you this question about a human being that's appearing at any festival that you're producing. What do you pay a cat <laughs> that has two million? <laughs> TikTok followers to attend your festival. Seriously, you have to tell us what does it cost to get a cat with two million followers at your festival? Okay, so I will say that when we actually fly in the cats, our budgets for flying in the cats and putting them up at hotels and paying them to appear um, is anywhere from two thousand to four thousand dollars. Oh, okay, it's not okay. Okay, I was. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. It's not thirty grand. It's no, it's not. And I mean, I will say, I think the feline family would charge more. Uh, but thankfully, we have this like good relationship. But uh, <laughs> virtually, um, we're, we are doing a celebrity cat uh, appearance fees. They're significantly smaller because it's virtual. And also, we make a lot less money when it's virtual. Who is, <laughs> so who is the uh, raise. who is, is is grumpy cat the most famous cat of all time? 
I think Grumpy Cat was the most famous cat of all time, but Grumpy Cat actually passed Ryan oh, okay. several years ago. Okay. Well, no, I mean, <laughs> so. uh, sorry, I could say like like I'm, I'm sort of more talking in the context of like of like Elvis Presley or Sophia Loren, like just like as an all yeah. time all time yeah. great. Um, w- would it be Grumpy? I think everyone is going to yeah, every yeah everyone would say like Grumpy Cat. Yeah, Gabriella, sure. I, I could tell. You I, have categories. Gabriella, category. Oh, jeez, Gabriella, I could tell. <laughs> I could tell that we got you thinking there. Would you have another? Would you have an alternative submission? Like I, I can think. This is kind of a cheap thing. To, this is a bit of a curveball. I'm getting us off track here for sure. But Linda, you know, I, I couldn't stand Odie growing up. As a matter of fact, I thought Odie was just a big dumb animal. I was a huge Garfield guy. I mean, no, it's animated. But but when it comes to the culture of cats, I'm I'm, I'm intentionally misportraying myself here as somebody who has no time for cats. I was a huge Garfield guy. Gabrielle, has there been a cat animated? living or dead real or otherwise that that has really that that is like your cat that like you that maybe you have like tattooed on your forearm or something like that <laughs> oh probably simba oh and though he's a lion i Ooh. guess no, no we, that counts. Real, that counts. the real the real talk judges have, the real talk judges have ruled they will accept that answer uh, they will accept. As a matter of fact, that's, it's the second time that Simba came up on the show in the last two weeks. We were talking about, we, we, were, we were speculating as, as part of our one of our highly serious monologues, uh, whatever happened to Jonathan Taylor Thomas? And we were searching his IMDb, <laughs> of course, the voice of Simba on The Lion King. So, so there you go. Really great to hang out with the two of you this morning. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad that we have found common ground. Uh, I'm glad that we've all come together here to agree that all animals are, are worth our love and celebration. But in this case, I will concede most especially the cat at Edmonton Cat Fest, <laughs> which runs Edmonton International Cat Fest, EdmontonCatFest.com, May 29th and 30th. Get your tickets on the website. Check it all live. Linda, that's huge, as you know, to have it on demand for the next three weeks. That's very cool. And will no doubt drive your revenues. Congratulations. We will respectfully disagree on the mugs, my friend. But that doesn't mean that you and I... Um, everybody's excited about the fact that yours has color on the inside, that orange splash of color on the inside. You do. I yeah, will. This was actually done um, by a local or I don't know. I don't know if this is I don't know if you have a mug sponsor. I can't talk. about. I don't have a person. no. We pay full. We pay full board for our mugs. So you, you, you go ahead and give a shout out to yours. <laughs> This is uh, from Promo Addict, who's uh, based in oh, Short Park. Oh, Russell uh, Bird. Russell he's a, who's yeah. Russell is a very good yeah. friend of mine, and actually, yeah. Russell's <laughs> Russell's actually quite annoyed that I didn't go with him to get my mugs done. So he. <laughs> So, so well, yeah, now you're missing that color in the middle. So Russell, <laughs> Russell will be thrilled to know that, that his name came up on the show. And I'm not surprised that he did such a good job. Thanks to the both. This is honestly been so we knew that this was going to be fun. But thanks for coming on to hang out with us. We, we really appreciate it. Thanks Thank so you. Much. Yeah, you bet. Bye. I, I have to be honest. I just, my, my pun game was not on. Like Linda just rolled like bang, bang. She's just dropping them. It's like carpet bombing. Uh, that's kind of a weird metaphor, but, but she like carpet bombs the cat puns and I just had nothing. I was sort of thinking along lines like litter or like press pause or I just, I, I had nothing. But I, th- I feel like you let her shine. It was. I tried to let her shine. I, I, I feel like I let the audience down a little bit. Uh, but, but well, no, because you were so focused on your hatred uh, that it, yeah. <laughs> it was. It was. It was more my. It was more. Sam, do you have? You have. I, we, we all know you have a dog. Do you have a cat? Not currently. I have had cats before. I had a cat when I grew up. My cat Willie, who was an indoor outdoor cat, would uh, walk down the street along the fence and meet us at the bus stop after school. Are you serious? Yeah. He was see the this. See if there were more. He was the absolute greatest. See if there were more cat stories like that. My cat walks with us. Uh, my dog Ranger and I. Is that right? Millie takes a walk with us on on a leash or just no. She. I tried to stop her, <laughs> but if she is outside when we head around the block. Millie goes on for a walk and everyone is always like, are you walking your cat? And I was like, I am not walking my cat. She is walking herself. And I just happen to be in the vicinity. Yeah. Um, this is, yeah, the, the, the live chat. I don't, I don't even know if I want to get into this because it's something, you know, there's no tone, right? There's no tone of voice on a chat. Yeah. So you can't really tell where people are coming from. You know, like, like. Haas, who says the only thing worse than a cat is a festival of cats, you know? <laughs> Dang. But at the same time, I mean, people are stepping up. Like Greg, for example, is wondering, like, where's mentions on Sylvester? Like, as yeah, a matter I feel fact, like that should be, we need to, can we get a, a question of the week on? Like the all-time, that's actually a great idea. 
<laughs> it's actually a great idea. We already know what our... So we've got our question of the week this week. Thanks to our friends at Y Station, our official research and strategy partners. Um, and it touches on... It's pretty serious business, obviously. Uh, Israel, Palestine, violence in the Middle East. Uh, quite frankly, it doesn't get more serious than that, really. And we appreciate the hundreds of you that have already chimed in. We're looking forward to seeing what those end results are. Next week, we already know, uh, we're going to have a question about athletes and racism in sport. Mm. Uh, racism aimed at celebrities and prolific figures. I think after that, I mean, those are, those are two pretty heavy subjects. We could probably work in another pretty fun one. Well, we can definitely, you know, get the cat angle, but also maybe famous dogs. I mean, you did reference Odie, who... Who's the most famous dog of all time, would you say? I mean, I mean, I don't know why Old Yeller first came to mind. I think there's probably more Lassie, fam- perhaps Lassie, yeah. or or even if you're going to go pure Canadiana, like Littlest Hobo. Oh, littlest oh, Hobo, of littlest. course. What was the Littlest Hobo's name? I don't know. I feel like we need we need to have. Did you uh, ever watch Benji? Oh yeah, are you kidding me? Benji was a big and a big and in my life. Yeah. Oh, famous dogs. Yeah. That is a. Can you could you even oh, name Snoopy? Snoopy? Snoopy. Yeah, Snoopy's got to be up there. Could you name a show the littlest hobo anymore? Is hobo a slur? Probably, as I've just said it six times. <laughs> well, it's an I, acronym, isn't I, it? I, is it? Because hobo is short for homeward bound. Oh. So how can that be a slur? Not sure. <laughs> it, I, I mean, it's also used to, you know, it's, label it, people in, that in are denig- down on their luck. So, in yeah. denigrating fashion. Yeah. yeah, it's used in denigrating fashion. We had to find some way to turn this controversial. Oh, Clifford the Red Dog. Thank you. Clifford the Big Red Dog. Yeah, Tom the Cat, Jerry the Mouse, says Kim. I, I also want to enter Itchy and Scratchy into that conversation. Uh, yes. Very well done. Beethoven, mm. another suggestion. Do you remember there was that there was that big thing? It was like a trend. I remember, I, I seem to remember Peter Jennings reporting on it, but at least somebody big in the U.S. did a big story because after those Beethoven films started coming out and everybody was getting their kids, these St. Bernard puppies. That's like 101 Dalmatians. Right. Yeah. And they're realizing, you know, these St. Bernards are like literally 160 pounds or 180 pounds. And then they all of a sudden had these St. Bernard rescues popping up because people that didn't do a whole lot of research. It's like the people that get their kids bunnies at Easter. Well, precisely. I mean, uh, 101 Dalmatians, then people got Dalmatians, and they're very high energy. They need lots of stimulation. They need to be very active. And people are like, whoa, 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 this is a lot of dog. And that's actually what I loved about Gabriella in uh, in her conversation, talking about that, you know, we're not focusing on breeds so much as just the actual personality and the relationship and the bond that folks have with their animals and so i mean i'm a huge i like i'm all about rescue so all my animals i have two cats and a dog and they are all rescue yeah um the watcher says uh my issue uh, this okay we're not we're not afraid to to look introspectively at our merch (laughs) the watcher says my issue with the real talk mugs is their size says give me this is a diner mug right these are the 12 ounce mugs it says give me a double size mug and then get them with that teal and green and blue inside, and then I'll use it for my tea, says the watcher. Here's the deal. The 12-ounce mug was, was chosen very specifically. Um, the best comment uh, or compliment that we've ever got, I think, about the mugs early in their infancy, you can find them right now at ryanjesperson.com. Someone said, I'm, I'm replacing my baseball bat under the bed with my Real Talk mug, which was, just goes to speak to the quality and the heaviness of it. If I hold my hand up like this, like I'm holding it now, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see, if I held it up like this for 30 seconds, it would start to hurt. It's like a kettlebell, uh, which is great. The, the 16-ounce mug, which potentially round two, I mean, we're going to do series and runs and special editions and cool stuff now that we have our e-commerce site set up uh, yet another mile marker at the six month mark of real talk um we made you bigger mugs but my pet peeve is is the bigger mugs whatever's in them cools off too quickly and then you find yourself getting in that where the coffee snobs will wrinkle their noses at you and and i'm one of them um but i still do it i do it quietly where no one can see me microwaving your coffee absolutely which is i mean yeah i mean absolutely but also like i know it's a huge no it's a huge no no but and I mean, so, I got told that I bastardized my coffee. That that gentleman is no longer in my life. Wow! Because I bastardized my coffee by uh, putting cream in it. So how about this from Genevieve? Genevieve says, "My teen who is tuned into Real Talk right now. First of all, shout out to all the teens tuned into Real Talk, the leaders of today and tomorrow. This show is for you, your parents, your grandparents, and your friends. Tell everybody." Back to Genevieve's message. My teen who's watching Real Talk right now would like to inform Ryan that there are actually tone indicators 
that people use in text. I love that. It's not the first time that a younger person has been smarter or more well-informed than me. And I really appreciate you tuning in right now. So we'll see what the, what the future Real Talk mugs might look like. I mean, the obvious answer here is a travel mug, right? But not everybody wants to travel. You know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We thought a diner mug was kind of the first thing. People that are chilling out, that are joining us at home, that want to put this on their office desk, that want to have a mug, they can be proud of. There you have it. You can find it online. The team of Westworld Computers for more than 40 years, family owned and operating in Western Canada out of their original store location in Edmonton. It means that their team of service techs have been at it with more than 40 years of experience. They've essentially seen the Mac lineup from the beginning, from inception, all the way through. You're not going to find more well-informed experts when it comes to getting your Mac back up and running than the team at Westworld Computers. Plus, their trade-up program, they're going to give you better value than anywhere else. You're not going to be on Kijiji trying to hawk your old MacBook. You trade it in, they'll transfer all the data to your new rig for free. You can find them online. They'll ship anywhere via westworld.ca. Also, shout out to the team at Eden Landscaping. May we tee this up? Who knew that when we brought Sarah Hoyles on board that she was bringing a Steven Spielberg type vibe? I should probably say Penny Marshall. Let's at least find a, you know, a great uh, director that, that has put together uh, a story, a short story in the form like Sarah Hoyles did yesterday. Now, you know, of course, if you're a regular here on the show, that we were blessed for, for more than two weeks by Sherry the Cherry Tree. It was the team at Eden Landscaping that brought her in to bring us some joy in studio. But of course, you know that Sherry needed her for forever home and yesterday mike at eden quite literally delivered okay uh okay well here it is so you can see mike uh you can see mike delivering the tree I'm so disappointed right now. We had Ozzy Mama, I'm coming home behind this we had a great soundtrack there but as you can see Mike brings the tree home Mike gets it in there Sarah yeah, and he he has the nice stakes in there. He he. Wa- oh, there's Ranger, uh, <laughs> and Sherry is home. So yeah, I mean he did it lickety split. It was so fast. I thought like he had this big massive digger. Like the I, I'm not gonna be able to use the right terminology, but he he was like no no I don't need that. He just he literally just manpowered it, just put his people power to it and <laughs> shoveled it out. And then it was incredible to watch him just do the precision to be able to pop the plug of the. Um, tree like the big the yeah tree. see again not having right words <laughs> i'm not an arborist that's not going to be shocking to anybody well but that's the whole point you don't have to be that's right when you partner with eden landscaping at landscape i love it and i love your video and thanks for putting so much effort into that a shout out to our friends at eden landscaping I got a great. This is this is some fun from when, uh, from Wendy. We always love when you when you take the time to make us laugh. You submit something. Um, Wendy's subject line says, "Call it the jab," and it caught our attention. And then, and then we saw that Wendy had a video attachment, and we went, "What's this all about?" And and we knew that people had had been debating on the show what what you're calling your vaccination. And we know that that vaccines are key to to any reentry plan. It doesn't matter what province you're in. It doesn't matter what state you may be watching us from, stateside or anywhere else around the world. We know that. That vaccines are directly tied percentages of society that, that the, the population that has received its first and second dose of the vaccine are, are directly tied to reopening or returns to some semblance of normalcy. And so people are taking it uh, on behalf. They're taking it on themselves they're, uh, to advocate, to celebrate vaccines. To You know, we talked to Clara Hughes about that and Arlene Dickinson. We talked to people that are that are stepping up and, and doing great jobs. This is our shot. They're telling everyone. Well, well, Wendy says, you know, I've been listening. Ryan on your podcast and your banter around vaccines and and what to call them and she says our family's vote is the jab she says and the reason why I'm most excited about that is you can jib jab all your family members if you have no idea what she's talking about don't worry we're going to show you in just a second you can conjabulate them this is going to go over the top of the the cat puns. I mean, this you know vaccine puns. This is going to be even better. She you says, can redeem yourself right <laughs> you can totally now. Totally redeem yourself. Yeah, you 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 could inject some new life into the. Okay, I'll try. Yeah, I don't mean I don't mean to needle Linda, and I don't mean to sort of provoke her. But uh, and, and I really don't want to be a prick. Uh, but what I do want to do is get back to Wendy's email where she says I've I, she says I've sent congratulations to my parents, my brother, my sister, my husband. My husband, she says, was a bit reluctant. 
to get vaccinated, specifically AZ, AstraZeneca. But he came around and ended up driving from Okotoks to Lethbridge for his jab this week. She says because supplies have been depleted for his eligibility in that neck of the woods. Got mine a couple of weeks ago, and the stress level is palpably less in our in our household. So, Sam, let's roll it. Wendy says, I, I sent you. She says, here's my hubby's jib jab. Check this out. Absolutely hilarious. Okay, so that's the jib jab. And that's Wendy's uh, hot hubby there. You can put your own face into the video. Uh, I hope he changes his bio on all social media to Wendy's hot hubby. Uh, She says, I'm really enjoying posting these jib jabs to my family's Facebook pages as both a personal congratulatory message and a wider vaccine promoting outreach. That from Wendy. And I thought it was great. We're going to see more citizen uh, involvement like that, I think. And and it all comes down to, I mean, we've seen a ton already. If If you're watching on TikTok or on Instagram, Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, what's been probably the most common selfie that's been posted in the last year? It has to be the vaccine selfies, right? Absolutely. I mean, some people were kind of like, uh, grown, don't, I don't want to see your vaccine selfie. But to me, I feel like it's, it's a, it's, it's a, a motivator. Like it actually, it's, it's building momentum and it's, it's encouraging just to see those. And it's actually, yeah, it, it's, it's showing us that, yes, people are getting vaccinated. They believe in the vaccine. And I thought the really cool one was when Gen X was, you know, got to have the AstraZeneca and they were like, yeah, we're rolling up sleeves. We're doing this and we don't want any drop of vaccine to go to waste. So yeah. I, I love them. I know people have some grown moments, but man, keep them coming. Yeah, no kidding. And 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 keep posting those selfies. I think it's so important. I think it's a it's a great effort that can that can certainly um, indicate to people around you that this is a step that you've taken, not only for your own well being, but for the well being of, of 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 others and businesses and of industry and of, of the general population as well. We encourage that. If you've enjoyed today's show, we want to remind you we totally appreciate every time you hit that like button. It just takes a quick second for those of you that. Our, our regulars, those of you members of our podcast, Real Talk audience, any review that you leave about our podcast is huge. We're not above or beyond reminding you that we're an independent upstart. This is a new media venture and everything that you do to put us on the radar of everybody else and those algorithms is so greatly appreciated. While we're talking about things that are going online, including CatFest, for example, let me remind you that Power Ed, uh, put on by Athabasca University, is offering short online and on-demand professional development courses and certificates. So this is this is leading edge, flexible, on-demand learning. Uh, we're talking like in some cases two or three hours. You don't have to dedicate a whole week or a whole month or a whole semester to learning more or bettering yourself or getting certified in, in areas like leadership, allyship and inclusion, project management, artificial intelligence, machine learning, digital transformation, digital wellness 101 is that course that they just released a couple of weeks ago you can learn more at powered.ca you know this takes two to three hours complete online on demand and you complete it on your own time at your own pace at powered.ca also big shout out to the team at grand dog essentials we've been talking see i didn't do this right in the middle of the cat interview I didn't do it. I mean, I know that we're. it's kind of funny. I'm grinding Linda's gears a little bit, having some fun. She's bringing in a chef to, to provide the cats with salmon. We're providing our dogs with like beef and bison and tripe and chicken. So who am I to talk about what we know about it? Hey, whatever your animal is, you're going to feed it the best possible food because they're your family members and you love them dearly. And if you have dogs in your household, you're going to want to check out the quality raw food by Grand Dog Essentials. If you use the promo code REALTALK at granddog.ca, they knock 10% off your first order. They deliver to your door in Calgary, Edmonton, and Central Alberta. And, of course, their team of nutritionists is there to help you find the specific solution to whatever your dog needs most. You'll find them online at granddog.ca. I can't believe it's going to be Friday tomorrow, which is absolutely wild. This week has just flown by. We're going to kick off our show tomorrow, but checking in with a physician who's been doing some study has a really interesting perspective. He's a, he's an immigrant Canadian working in a rural community, and he's got a message to visible minorities when it comes to vaccines. A fascinating take. 
Plus, we get back to the ethics of eating, the indigenous perspective on hunting, trapping, and evolving practices and traditions. It's going to be a great conversation. We'll see you then.